Number one, I find it harder to trade when I have a lack of clear narrative or lack of major references. Yes, so do I. Uh, sometimes I don't trade at all. Good for you. Uh, in fact, I'm going to go ahead and you guys let me know. I'm going to go ahead and click answer live here. Does that mean you guys can somehow see the question? Sweet. I'm glad that works. Okay, awesome. All right, so still on part one here. How much lower time frame do you use? What? The, okay, this is a lot of questions. <laughs> um, what situations do you normally use to scalp and how do you scalp? How much lower time? <laughs> oh, man. Uh, okay, let me just read through all this and then we'll answer what we can. Uh, what do you use to signal a scale out or close the trade? Could it be DVA opposite edge VWAP discretionary based on order flow or footprint? I know it's very situational. So for general question, all good. So um, number one, the most important thing is what I'm hearing from you is great in terms of, I always tell people, people don't understand. People take the NADRO course and a lot of them are still a little bit What's the word? Immature, still a little sheep out there looking for that next magic thing that's going to give them this perfection and clarity every day. And what I teach with Nadro and learning to decipher this like secret language of the market and the way I talk about this stuff, I genuinely believe it. It's not like, you know, sales language. So you buy a course, I could care less. But it really is a way of understanding markets on a very deep level. But the goal each day, and it's a toxic trader assumption to assume otherwise, the goal each day is to determine whether or not we have clarity or not. Just because you learn to speak that language, just because you learn to see these great risk reward and multiple time frame dimensions and and, and all this stuff, it doesn't mean that the goal each day is to find the next home run because they are not always present. And one of the beautiful things about learning to speak this language and learning to, to see markets the way we do is that you see the days where it's not there. And guess what? That's just as important as the days where it is. One of them is going to make you money. One of them is probably going to keep you from losing a bunch of money. Both of those things are equally as good to your bottom line. It's very, very important. So what I'm hearing from you there, and I'll read it again here for everyone. When I have a lack of clear narrative or lack of major references, sometimes I don't trade at all. That is the way it should be. Wonderful. Now, I can tell you're smart here because you're asking the follow-up question. What, do you, what about scalping? Do you do that? What do you do, use to do that? You're hitting on something very key there, which is when I don't have really key references and clarity with my narrative read and let's say a big idea for the day, um, I tend to be shorter term. I tend to do what I call scalping a bit more. My definition of scalping is really something, because I know a lot of people use that word very, very differently. Um, but for me, when I talk about a scalp, it's something that it's really just, it's not backed by my higher time frames. essentially. It's not supported by a strong narrative. It might just be a simple trade around prior value based on something I'm seeing in the order flow. Um, you know, a failure of a trend to persist into an area where I wasn't really interested, but, you know, things look really nicely. I'll take a, you know, a reversion towards VWAP into the close, you know, just all kinds of little things. I might only trade direct momentum. Sometimes I'll put a trade on because I think order flow is going to one of our key kind of magnets and that there's a price action pattern that supports it. I can see where traders are stopped. I can see where we have a poor high or poor low and stop runs are vulnerable. And I'll just scalp it until, you know, I see something that confirms the exhaustion, if you will, or capitulation in order flow. So the answer is yes, I do that. And I use all kinds of tools to do that. All of them NADRO based, all of them, you know, exactly what I teach. It's just, you know, it, I tend to, you know, you've got N-A-D-R-O with N being by far the most important, but when we don't have N, but you got to be careful with this could be a slippery slope. 
I'll take what I call a DRO trade, right? DVA rhythm and order flow, checking out a little short-term opportunity. It's not necessarily supported by a narrative, an acceptance of narrative. So um, absolutely, uh, to answer another one of your questions, could I scale out at the opposite edge of DVA? Absolutely. That's very, very common for a rotational type play. Um, could I scale or exit based on something on order flow? Yes, absolutely. Um, so I, I think that's a good answer for, for number one there. Um, Mr. Homeboy Matthew says, not so much a question, but more of a comment. Uh, I always knew the importance of selectivity, but your video DMIs really push that point home. In order to really trade Nadro properly, limiting compromises when selecting trades is critical. Huge help. So yeah, I think um, I think that's um, perhaps a bigger point than like obviously you've realized it, but I'd love to also comment on this and, and almost take it like a question because I think there's a lot of people, perhaps on this call, who haven't quite arrived at that yet, right? You want we, we if you use all the tools that I teach you end up with a bunch of references and you end up with a bunch of quote unquote reasons to take a trade all over the place. And that's not the goal of what we're doing here. The goal is to rank and distill that information. Like we talked about with um, Luis's second question into what's most important when, you know, I have an advanced group mentoring class right now and one of the skills that we've laid out for them to monitor and self-rate themselves on every single day is reading narrative. Does that mean that they get it perfectly right? No, it doesn't. But it is a daily process of preparing and then going to execute based on that preparation and then reviewing how good was that preparation now that I have the benefit of hindsight. How good were my hypos? How good was what I thought the market was telling me was most important across, you know, I chose the confluence of these two time frames and the narrative I was seeing there versus, you know, I kind of ignored a, a structural reference and, and, and whatnot. And now that I can look at it with hindsight, hmm, it didn't work out the best today. Does that mean that it was necessarily the best decision or the worst decision? Not necessarily, so be careful, but... Over time, if you continue to do that and continue to do that and you, you start to see, wow, every time I choose this and ignore that, that's not such a great idea. So let me stop doing that. Let me put a little more weight on this or that and begin to get better at reading the narrative. Some people just flat out use some of the long-term VWAPs ineffectively. They will latch on to one single reference that their mind is just telling them, you know, Yearly VWAP, for example. Oh, this is the most important thing ever. So, you know, we're above it. I'm going to buy this pullback into it. Well, guess what? There's eight other things you're ignoring, including including value migration and a, a breakout pullback lower and an imbalance on this time frame and blah, 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 all bearish. But you're really fixated on that yearly VWAP and you want to buy in front of it. That's a narrative reading problem that you should address and at least correct over time as you figure out that that's not. Now, you could just listen to my course again and you're going to understand, don't do that. <laughs> um, but a lot of people have to learn stuff on their own. And I, I'm one of those people. So, it, you know, for example, even people who did like um, the old course I had, you know, the Futures Foundation course or whatever years ago, they, they hear NADRO, you know, through the NADRO course with Apteros and it's like, whoa, that is said in a little different way. That is explained with an example I didn't think of before, whatever. And now I really, really get it. Like it's that Nadro is peeling back layers of an onion because that's kind of how we approach it from a top down, multi layered, multi dimensional thing. And quite frankly, it's, it's like drinking from a fire hydrant at the beginning, which is why I always encourage people to simplify their narrative reads at the beginning. Spend a couple months only using market profile, right? And your intraday charts for, for timing and rhythm and acceptance, all that stuff. 
and then maybe add in a couple longer time frames here and there and begin to use that. Maybe begin to monitor it, but don't have it a part of your official process yet until you gain confidence with doing it. So anyways, um, back to Matthew's comment here around how he's getting insight here by seeing my morning prep each day at just how important selectivity is. But he's not necessarily talking about trading. He's talking about selectivity around references, contextual views. As in, you'll he's focused, just as an example. I know Matthew well, so I'm, I'll, I'll make fun of him. He doesn't care. Matthew comes in, and he's all fixated on the yearly VWAP. Oh, man, we're testing yearly VWAP. It's right at a century figure at 4,000. It's perfect. I, I just know it's going higher from here. You know, obviously there's like flawed thinking, you know, with that, with that type of certainty thinking. So that's how he's approaching it. And then he sees my DMI. He hears me talk through my scenarios and sees where my key lines in the sand are and whatnot. And I don't even mention that reference. I have no levels in that area. And he's scratching his head. Wow. So Merritt's seeing something different. That's why the DMI is cool for various groups of people. For some people, it will open their eyes over time as to we're not just another like slap on some levels on a chart and point out the ones that work in hindsight. That's not what we're doing here. Some days it's, you know, I'm very markedly bullish or bearish. It's not just like, here's levels. Look, we bounced off one. Um, so we're, we're, we're showing people that we walk the walk and that we're different in terms of how we can read a market each day before it ever plays out. And then for students like Matthew, they're seeing, wow, Merritt was thinking differently here about this than I was. That's a learning opportunity. That's a way to get better. Usually, sometimes I'm wrong. <laughs> sometimes I make mistakes. Okay. Um, usually it's a, a way for them to get some, some further insight as a student, knowing what I'm using and to, to come up with.